Good evening, everyone, and let me give a very, very warm welcome to all of you to the Hearty School. Um, we're very delighted and honoured tonight to welcome the Speaker of the UK House of Commons, John Burko, to Hearty. Um, I have to say it's a particular delight for me as a UK citizen, as a Brit living in Germany, to, uh, to invite here to Hearty someone who's a representative, of course, of the institution perhaps of which we're most proud in the UK, um, our parliament. Um, I have to say that as a Brit living in the UK, I sort of get very, very different responses from Germans and also from non-Germans uh, that I meet here in Germany. Um, on the one hand, there, there's always this kind of, sort of sense of warmth uh, towards the UK, towards its institutions, towards its sort of cultural contribution to the world. But also often in Germany, a, a kind of sense of puzzlement about Britain. So that can sometimes be a puzzlement, of course, about Britain's role in the world or Britain's relationship vis-a-vis -vis its European partners. But it's also, of course, a puzzlement about its unique system of parliamentary democracy, which includes everything from its rather uh, idiosyncratic uh, upper chamber, which includes everything from bishops to some of the landed gentry of the United Kingdom, to its always interesting but sometimes rather raucous um, lower chamber, the House of Commons, of which uh, the presiding officer is with us today. So I think it's, it's very appropriate that we have a chance to sort of clarify some of that puzzlement and discuss what is unique about the British system and um, what some of the lessons of the British system are um, for us here um, this evening. Let me just say a few words about uh, John Burko. Um, speaker Burko was elected as the Speaker of the UK House of Commons in June 2009. Um, he's been someone who's been very politically active all his life from a very young age. He was the Chairman of the Federation of Conservative Students as well as a borough councillor before becoming a Member of Parliament for Buckingham in 1997. He's also held uh, quite a wide range, I think, of portfolios uh, in the shadow cabinet and also positions that involve government um, with a particular interest, for example, in international issues. So he's been the chairman uh, or the vice chairman of all party groups in the UK dealing with human rights issues and also dealing with particular areas of the world um, where we've had significant debates over human rights protection in the last decade, including Burma and Sudan. Um, he's also someone who's taken an interest in the protection of children and other vulnerable groups in society. He led a review appointed by the Labour government in 2007 on services for children and young people with special needs in the UK. But of course, uh, he's also um, been the Speaker of the UK House of Commons at a time of, I guess, uh, a particularly interesting time as regards the, the UK Lower House of Parliament, a time that began with a period of, uh, of anxiety, and even some might even use that, that overused word crisis, um, but nonetheless uh, has also steered through some very significant uh, reforms to the way in which that chamber has worked over the last years, and we're very much looking forward uh, to hearing from him. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, for the next 45 minutes, we're going to have a, uh, a speech from Mr. Burko, and we'll have time for discussion afterwards. I'll leave the floor to you. Mark, thank you for the warmth and generosity of that introduction, to which I don't know whether I'm equal, though I'm bound to say that having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> whether you'll feel the same way at the end of my remarks is, of course, a matter of legitimate speculation and conjecture. And I ought, by way of either caveat or apology, to stress before I proceed further that something might have been lost in translation the responsibility for which is unclear and about which we won't worry because I didn't come specifically with the intention of focusing on the subject of the scrutiny of legislation in the Mother of Parliaments, though I'm very happy to engage with that subject in respect of the different stages of legislation in our two Chambers of Parliament. I'm very open to any thoughts you might have and to a dialogue on the vexed question of European scrutiny, issues of allocation of time, of pre-legislative scrutiny in which we're indulging somewhat more than we used to do are of enduring interest and that's something of which I think we ought to do rather more, pre-legislative scrutiny causing better quality bills to come forward in the first instance would almost certainly augur well for the conduct of our parliament and for the quality of our lawmaking, and there's the almost equally interesting subject of 
post-legislative scrutiny as well. So the truth of the matter, in fact, is that you could probably have at the Hertie School of Governance a year's worth of seminars on the subject of legislation, and you'd really only just about be testing the water. So there's plenty of scope for us to discuss matters of mutual interest. But in fact, I had come with the intention in the first instance of focusing on, as Marcus just indicated, the role of the speaker in the UK House of Commons, not in a spirit, I hope, of self-regard, but because it is actually amongst academics a relatively under-addressed phenomenon and feature of the UK British political system and possibly of political systems more widely. Much is written about the executive branch, about the quality of the legislature, about the balance between the power of a prime minister or a president and that of the cabinet as a system of government, but not all that much is said about specifically the role of the speaker, which of course differs sharply, not just colleagues between speakers in democracies and speakers in autocracies or dictatorships, but differs significantly between different democracies. And I feel a great sense of privilege to come to the Hertie School of Governance, I think a year before I am advised you are due to celebrate your 10th anniversary, but I'm very conscious of the seriousness and quality of the research that takes place here, facilitated, I'm sure, by outstanding teaching. And given that you are preparing for senior positions of leadership in governance, business, and elsewhere, I would hope that this otherwise perhaps under-mentioned subject would be of some significance in your minds. Before I do say more about the role of the speaker in the chamber, the significance of the process of parliamentary reform in which we are engaged, and an additional element which I have sought to introduce into the functions of the speaker, it might be an idea if I treat first, colleagues, of one rather sensitive matter which I think on the whole your natural courtesy will disincline you to raise with me directly, but which if unaddressed will lurk mischievously and perhaps even from my vantage point perilously in the undergrowth and which I judge therefore needs to be knocked on the head at the outset. And that, colleagues, is the persistent, almost pervasive suggestion in the more down-market parts of the British media that I am, in fact, the shortest man ever to be Speaker of the UK House of Commons. Now, I think I ought really, just as our little secret within these four walls, to explain that I have always been short. I remain short. I am now 50 years old, and the overwhelming likelihood is that I shall become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still. And about the fact of that continued and soon to be exacerbated shortness, colleagues, I am as intensely relaxed as Peter Mandelson, the Svengali of New Labour, once famously said, New Labour was intensely relaxed about people becoming filthy rich. But I am not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical accuracy. And you would, forsooth, expect the speaker to have done his research. In that respect, if in no other, I shall not disappoint you. I have done so. And I can assure you, simply as a matter of historical fact, that the suggestion that I'm the shortest man ever to hold the office of speaker in the UK is simply wrong. Sir John Bussey, Speaker of the UK House of Commons. From 1394 to 1398, Sir John Wenlock, Speaker of the House from 1455 to 1456, and Sir Thomas Tresham, Speaker of the House in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am, although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. 
Indeed, no fewer than seven of my predecessors met their end on the executioner's table. One was killed in battle, and a further poor unfortunate soul was brutally murdered. So you will understand that this does enable me to view the present woes and challenges which afflict and confront the House of Commons with an appropriate sense of historical proportion. That is to say, whatever else happens to me, I am not likely to lose my head. You may wonder, and if you don't, you should, why the Speaker is so called, for at least in the British system and in many others, the one thing that the Speaker doesn't do is to speak in debates. I speak in the House of Commons in my capacity and only in my capacity as Speaker, which essentially means as chair, referee, or if you prefer the term, umpire. You may therefore be interested to know the origin of the title Speaker, and it goes back several hundred years. In the very early days of the Speakership in the 14th and for some centuries beyond, the Speaker was expected to be the King's spokesman to Parliament. That is to say he, and it was always a he in those days, was not merely exhorted, but required to present the King's case for the raising of funds, to support armies, for the conduct of wars and other expeditions in France and elsewhere, for the material aggrandizement and greater power of the king. And it was only really, if I give the most fleeting synopsis of English history, following the conclusion of the English Civil War, that the speaker ceased to be the king's spokesman to parliament and instead effectively became transmuted into parliament's spokesman to the king. We have, of course, now in the UK and have had for generations a constitutional monarchy and at the epicenter of our political system is Parliament and although of course in the name of etiquette and diplomatic protocol there are periodic requirements for representatives of Parliament including notably the Speaker to meet Her Majesty the Queen there is no sense these days of a master servant or mistress servant relationship the speaker is, in our system, the chair, or as I say, the referee or umpire. And again, in a way that you may regard as excessively pedantic, but which is deep-rooted in the British, or at least the British parliamentary psyche, the speaker upon election, in order not only to be, but to be seen to be impartial as between the parties, is required to renounce his or her party affiliation. Therefore, in conformity with convention on the 22nd of June 2009, I resigned my membership of the Conservative Party, an organization of which I had been a member for over 29 years, writing to the party chairman at the time, Eric Pickles, to say, I'm sorry, I must now leave, and that is because the House wants to be assured that the Speaker has relinquished past affiliation. So I did what my predecessor Michael Martin and his predecessor Betty Boothroyd had did. They had both been Labour members and resigned from the Labour Party. I resigned from the Conservative Party. So although people say, oh well, aren't you still on that side? The truth of the matter is you are obliged to be on no side but simply to be the referee. And again, consistent with that expectation and required arrangement, at the subsequent general election, the Speaker has to stand, not as a party candidate, which he or she does in so many democracies, but as the Speaker seeking re-election. Once again, it is not a matter of law but of convention that the major parties don't put up candidates against the Speaker seeking re-election, and therefore if there are to be candidates, if there is to be a contest in the Speaker's constituency, it comes about because other people choose to put up against the Speaker. So in May 2010, 11 months after I had been elected Speaker, 
No Conservative candidate stood against me. No Labour candidate stood against me. No Liberal Democrat candidate stood against me. But I faced opposition from, I think, no fewer than 10 candidates, including a fascist candidate from the British National Party, the UK Independence Party's representative, Mr. Farage, and various other people to boot. That in itself is a matter of some controversy, and I'm very happy to answer questions on that theme if it's of interest to you. But although the subject is controversial in that there are people who say, well, there ought to be an election and it's not fair on the electorate that there isn't a party choice in the constituency. Of one thing I am sure in my own mind and quite insistent about if challenged, and that is that the speaker can continue to represent his or her constituency through effective correspondence with ministers in the way that ministers in the government have to represent their constituents. Ministers in the government don't speak in parliament other than as ministers. They represent their constituents through correspondence and, where necessary, through meetings with their ministerial colleagues or representatives of public agencies. And that's what I, as speaker, do. I correspond and, where necessary, on an issue of moment or salience to a large number of my constituents. I don't mean simply an individual blocked drain type situation, but where there are huge numbers of constituents affected, I asked the minister to come and see me. I was struck, I must tell you colleagues, very early on in my time as speaker, suddenly to find that I got much quicker replies from ministers in the government. And in particular, I think top of the tree for efficient and effective performance was Jack Straw, who was then the Justice Secretary. And I said to my then private secretary, I'm very impressed by the speed with which, and the detail in which, ministers are now replying to me. And he said to me, there's no surprise about that, Mr. Speaker. It's a very considerable mark of shame upon a government department if it so hacks off the Speaker that the Speaker demands to see the Secretary of State. So I said, in a slightly casual way, oh, I see, so if I'm fed up with Jack, I go and see him at the Ministry of Justice, do I? To which he replied, no, Mr. Speaker, in those circumstances, you don't go to the Ministry of Justice to see Mr. Secretary Straw. Mr. Secretary Straw comes to see you in Speaker's House for a meeting without coffee. <laughs> now, that's never happened. But I mention this, colleagues, in order to underline the fact that in our system, the speakership is important. I'm not important at all, other than, I hope, to my wife and three small children. But the institution, the office of the Speaker is important in our parliament and in recognition both of its centrality to our political arrangements and of the fact that the speaker can't speak in debates, the speaker gets, if you will, an express deluxe service in the form of speedier and often more detailed replies from ministers and, as I say, the speaker can simply ask to see any relevant minister in his office at any time, sometimes in the company of constituents to discuss a matter of interest. In my time, I've had the Home Secretary, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, successive Secretaries of State for Transport, because I have a big transport issue in my constituency, which a lot of people are concerned about, the Health Minister, the Disability Minister, the Secretary of State for Education, the Local Government Minister, all into Speaker's House to engage with me on matters that affect my constituents. Day to day, I return to the point that my job is to chair and to decide who to call to speak at question time or in debates. Question time is partly predetermined by a ballot, which means that people on the order paper have to be called to ask a question whether the speaker wants to call them or not. But there are usually opportunities for what we call supplementary questions. And if you ever watch the British Parliament, you might be struck, if you're not in the know, by the frequency with which people stand at the end of a question. And you may, if you're not aware of the procedure, think that this is a rather incongruous state of affairs. Why do people keep standing up? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is that they are seeking to catch the speaker's eye. It is a way of signalling to the chair, I wish to take part in this exchange as well. And my task is to go backward and forward from one side of the house to the other, deciding who to call, just as, of course, in debates I have to decide who to call to speak. And what I have in my mind as relevant factors are really the following. How often has that person spoken or asked a question? Can I be sure that I'm getting a balance between people who entered Parliament half a century ago and people who came in in a by-election three months previously? 
Am I ensuring that sufficient women, who on the whole are better behaved in Parliament than the men, are getting their chance to speak? Is it a satisfactory balance between England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland? And am I, as best I can and within my knowledge, facilitating the widest possible expression of opinion on the subject under discussion? Now, obviously, I don't know people's views on everything, but it is the responsibility of the Speaker to know every member of the House, to know his or her name and preferably constituency and certainly party, and it's up to me to know on key issues what people think. So if you take the issue of Europe, European integration, Britain's relations with, with the EU, of course I know that on the Conservative side, Bill Cash and John Redwood are very, very, very strong Eurosceptics, or some of you might even describe them as Europhobes. But it's up to me also to know that on the Conservative side, a man called Neil Carmichael, who's much less well known, is a striking pro-European. And if I'm looking for some balance in the voices from the Conservative benches, I would tend to bear in mind Neil. On the Labour side, if anything, there is a starker divide because the Conservative Party is predominantly Eurosceptic these days. On the Labour side, you've got people like Keith Vaz and Peter Hayne, both former ministers for Europe, who are very, very strong pro-Europeans. But then you've got people like Gisela Stewart and Kelvin Hopkins, two Labour MPs who are very, very Eurosceptic. So I'm looking for that balance. And similarly, in the great dispute over Israel-Palestine, it's not just a question of divisions between parties, but divisions within parties. Can I satisfy everybody in choosing who to speak? What are those pigs I see flying in front of my very eyes? The answer assuredly, ladies and gentlemen, as you won't be surprised to discover, is no. There are colleagues who are firmly convinced that there is no debate on the floor of the Chamber of the House of Commons that cannot be improved via a contribution from them of very considerable eloquence and equal length. But it's a kaleidoscope in Parliament. You know, we're in that sense not that different from society. There are people who are very expressive of face, happy if called, discontented if not. And there are those who accept their lot pretty much without complaint. I can think of a number in that category. Kelvin Hopkins is a very good example. Somebody actually with very strong views on the Labour benches, but a very cheery, sunny disposition. If he's called to speak, fine. If he's not, he doesn't complain. And sometimes one wishes there were more like him, but that's the way of the world. So I do my best to ensure that full and fair expression of opinion. And of course, I have to keep order as well as encouraging people to take part, I have to keep order and to try to reduce the number of people excluded altogether as a result of bad behaviour. I don't often have reason to remove anybody from the chamber. It's pretty rare. But there was a case relatively recently with a Labour member, Paul Flynn, who transgressed by accusing the Secretary of State for Defence, not on a substantive motion that sat on the order paper, which would have brought him in order, but just in the course of a brief, if you like, unscripted debate of being a liar. This was in relation to Afghanistan. And I asked Paul Flynn, who's a very, very long-serving and competent backbench member, to withdraw the term, and he refused. And I said, the honourable gentleman is grossly out of order in making that charge, and I must ask him for one last time to withdraw the term that he has just used. And he refused. I think he felt that he'd committed himself, and it was what he believed, and he wasn't prepared to withdraw it. So it wasn't actually a rancorous or aggressive exchange between us. I felt I had to give him at least a couple of opportunities, but he declined to withdraw the term. And in those circumstances in our parliament, we name the offending member. Otherwise, you refer to people as the honourable gentleman, the member for, or the honourable lady, etc., etc. I said, I name Mr. Paul Flynn, which means thereafter he is effectively banished from the chamber. The motion is formally put by the leader of the house or the deputy leader, and it's almost certain to be passed, usually without a vote. The opposition were rather embarrassed by the whole thing. He's an opposition member, so they were happy for it to go through quickly, and Paul Flynn had to depart the chamber. And in fact, because of the time at which he was excluded, he went, in fact, a month without salary. So it was quite an expensive protest on his part, but there you go. So that, in a sense, gives you a feel for what I do in 
the chair, and the question of my views on a subject really just doesn't come into it. I'm just thinking, are the views being expressed? Is the dissident voice heard? Can I guarantee that it's not just the mainstreamers that are speaking, but those with perhaps slightly different viewpoints? And am I also guaranteeing the rights of minority parties? Because we have a different arrangement from you. Speaker Lamott doesn't control the selection of speakers. I understand that the parties have a list, and they give that list to Speaker Lamott, but that isn't how we do it. The speaker decides who will speak. But of course, I've got to do it fairly, otherwise there will soon be widespread criticism. I would say on the whole, we get more people in at the moment than before, not because of any magical quality on my part, which manifestly I don't possess, but because we use time limits more often than in the past. It's pretty common now to say there will be a time limit, 10 minutes, eight minutes, six minutes. We had a big debate on equal marriage a fortnight ago, 66 people were called to speak from the back benches, but the only way I could do that, which meant calling pretty well everybody who wanted to speak, was by saying, look, back benches will have to speak for no more than four minutes each. Now, that may seem fairly testing, but it can be done, and people on the whole felt they'd rather speak and get their thoughts on the record and register a view than not have the chance. I said that I'd say something about parliamentary reform colleagues. Traditionally, the role of the speaker in the chair, which is by far the best known and most visible of the speaker's functions, was very much to the fore, not merely to the partial, but almost to the complete exclusion of any other role in the parliamentary process. That, I think, has changed because... At the time I sought election, and reference was made to this by Mark, there was a wider sense of crisis afflicting the House of Commons, consequent in the immediate term upon the reputational carnage inflicted by the expenses scandal. We had this massive row and public exposure of the extent of parliamentarians' expenses claims for the reimbursement of costs incurred. A very unsatisfactory, outdated, excessively secretive, patently indefensible system, which we have since replaced with an obviously preferable system characterized by equity, transparency, audit, and accountability. But when I stood for election, I had nine opponents for the chair. And I said, look, I don't know what colleagues think, but in my view, if there's anybody here who thinks that the only problem from which we're suffering is the inability or unwillingness of the other two to devise and operate, a defensible expenses system, that colleague is frankly deluded on an industrial scale because this problem we now face hasn't created our bad image or reputation. It is merely in the short term and possibly even medium term exacerbated it. The truth is we've long been held in ill regard and we can argue the toss as to the reasons for that, people thinking politicians are all the same and they don't deliver on their promises some arguing that the declining respect for politicians is on account of the fact that the parties are too similar and that there isn't sufficient of a policy choice. There are all sorts of arguments about it. I would argue that it's partly because we're in an age in which people expect instant satisfaction of wants or almost instant gratification. And through the use of the modern computer, you can obtain the meal, the book, the film, the consumer durable, the car, the holiday of your choice at a moment's notice. And one of the difficulties with politics is that it is, of course, deliberative in character. And people often vote and then feel that they don't get what they voted for, or they get only part of it, or they get it too slowly. And so that may be a factor. I argued to my colleagues that one thing that had caused Parliament to be held in low esteem was a general sense, which I couldn't statistically prove, but which I believe to have been valid, that as an institution, we were pretty ineffective. We had become but a rubber stamping operation for the executive branch, that is to say, for the government. And I remember saying to colleagues, look, we ought to use this opportunity of the speakership election to resolve to get off our knees as an institution 
and start to assert ourselves, the better to redress the balance between the executive branch and the legislature. And if you elect me as speaker, I will do what I can on my own and more that I can do in concert with colleagues to try to bring about a step change in the relationship in favor of an effective, assertive, dynamic, topical parliament. So I said, look, you know, elect me and I will try to speed up question time because it's too slow with too many rather long questions and long answers. We don't get through enough. There are a lot of frustrated colleagues every day. Now, whether I'm any good as speaker, I always say this and I believe it, is ultimately not for me to say. That's for you and others to judge. But I am seeking to do what it said on the tin. And just as a matter of fact, we do make sharper progress these days, partly because I've made it clear that that's what I'm looking for. And colleagues are pithier in their questions. And to be fair, ministers are a bit pithier in their replies. The prime minister is sharper in answering questions perhaps than some of his predecessors. Typically in half an hour on a Wednesday, we get through somewhere between 28 and 31 questions, which in 30 minutes is not bad. So the focus is on getting a sharp question and a sharp answer, not sort of long dilations on subjects. I did also say, look, I think there are big problems in our parliament. In my view, it is totally unsatisfactory that ministers are constantly briefing the media about their policy announcements and intentions, tipping off favoured journalists or appearing on the Today programme when they should be coming to the Chamber of the House of Commons, consistent with our standing orders, to announce new proposals with a view to being scrutinised by elected members. And if you elect me, I intend to try to ensure that that happens, and in particular to revive the mechanism which had fallen into desuetude of the urgent question, capital U, capital Q, a feature of our standing orders under which any member, colleagues, can apply to the Speaker for permission urgently to question a minister from a particular department on a matter that has just arisen, where, for whatever reason, the minister hasn't volunteered to come to the House. Now, that I have done. In the year before I was elected Speaker, two urgent question applications were granted. I think in my first year we had 24, and we've had about 120 plus over the last three and a half years, spanning most government departments. So where the issue is important, the subject is live, and the minister has not treated of it in parliament, or at any rate, not through an oral statement, and I've judged, well, this is something that needs the attention of the House. I've granted permission for the urgent question to be put, and the minister has had to come, often at rather short notice, an hour or two's notice, and then typically there'll be exchanges for 20, 25 minutes, half an hour, sometimes even longer. And I would argue that that's a good thing for Parliament. On the whole, I think it's encouraged ministers actually to volunteer more statements of policy to Parliament because they would rather do it on their own terms than be dragged to the House. But as you can tell, there have been 120 plus occasions over the last three and a half years where they have had to be dragged to the House. One of the benefits of that, if I can put it to you as students of government, is that it has meant that members feel there's a purpose in coming into the chamber because they can actually air their concern on an important issue in the House rather than through the mechanism of a radio or television interview at Millbank or on College Green near Parliament. Another associated merit is that by definition the media have to report the fact of the exchange taking place and they are effectively obliged to make it clear that that exchange is taking place in the Chamber of the House of Commons. So regularly a sky strapline in Britain is urgent question to the Home Secretary at 3.30 p.m. in the House. Now, I don't grant the question for that reason. You've got to grant the question because it merits the attention of the House. But it is, I think, a very worthwhile byproduct of this developing phenomenon that the media are reporting it, it makes the place seem more relevant to what people in the dog and duck are discussing, and gradually it is contributing to a sense that the House of Commons, once the cockpit of power and the forum for effective political debate, is perhaps in some danger of becoming so again. I did also say to colleagues, look, I think it is absolutely ridiculous that the chairs of the select committees which scrutinise the executive by assessing the performance of government departments are hand-picked by representatives of that very executive 
typically chairs of select committees before 2010 were appointed by government, for the most part, and to an extent by opposition, whips. They were prizes for good behavior. And sometimes people being put on committees as members, not as chairs, were prizes for good behavior or penalties for bad. A member would be put on a committee in which he or she had not the slightest interest by the whips as a penalty for failing to vote with the party on some other matter. And I said, look, colleagues, frankly, we ought to resolve to elect, preferably by secret ballot of the whole house, those who chair our committees, and the parties ought internally to elect their members of those committees. It's no good honorable and right honorable members coming up to me and other candidates in this election bemoaning the fate of the downtrodden, poor, miserable backbench member unless people who consider themselves poor, miserable, downtrodden backbench members are prepared to do something about their fate and to insist that in fact up with this, as Churchill would have said, they will no longer put. And I'm pleased to say that I did manage to persuade the government in the last parliament to have the vote on these matters, proposed reforms that had been considered by a reform committee on the House of Commons, debated and voted on before the general election. And I'm pleased to say that the House voted for election of select committee chairs and members to be elected. And they also voted to create something else which I'd campaigned for, with others, I hasten to add, in standing for speaker. And that is a backbench business committee which controls the business of the House now 35 days a year. We sit about 150 days a year. So 35 days a year is not a king's ransom. It's not a huge proportion of parliamentary time, but it is at least a start. Thither too, the arrangement was that the whole schedule of Parliament was determined by what we call the business managers, the government whips and to a lesser extent the opposition whips. And I argued, well, backbenchers ought to take some control of the parliamentary agenda and to decide what is to be debated. And now BBCOM, as it's known, the Backbench Business Committee, chooses often for debate subjects which absolutely would not be chosen by the government and sometimes not even by the opposition front bench, but they're matters that require to be aired and which are perhaps the subject of public petitions. And they are Parliament's response in many cases, to that public democratic pressure from the grassroots. And we've had now bucket loads of debates on those matters. And again, it's been a new phenomenon, because ordinarily the government will table a motion, or if the opposition does, the government will try to amend it. With backbench business, my starting principle is let the backbenches decide what they want to debate. I remember in one of the very early debates, the government tabled a wrecking amendment to a backbench business motion. They didn't really want to vote against the motion, which was on a really worthy subject. Whoops. So they tabled an amendment to it. And I decided, no, I'm not selecting this amendment. Let the debate be on the subject the backbench business committee chose. And one of the government whips said, well, Mr. Speaker, without in any way questioning your authority in the chair, which is precisely what he was doing, I struggled to find any precedent for the non-selection of a government amendment. And I said, yeah, but the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right, but his point is both true and irrelevant. And the reason why it's irrelevant is that we're now in uncharted territory. This is backbench business, and the debate should be on the backbench motion, and the House can reach its conclusion. If the Honourable Gentleman and the government don't like the motion, of course, it's perfectly open to them to urge their colleagues to vote against it. But what they shouldn't do is totally distort the debate by tabling what is effectively another matter for debate. So I think that that's been quite an important power struggle between the back benches and the front. And I do think it's the responsibility in those circumstances of the Speaker to support Parliament in standing up for itself. And ultimately, a good, strong parliament is in the interest not just of individual honourable members or of the electorate in a diffuse sense. It's in the interests of good government, colleagues, because if you have a system in which all of the balance of power is heavily weighted in the direction of the executive branch, which has got vast resources at its disposal, and you have an inefficient, ineffective, cowed, enfeebled parliament, that's bad for the quality of government because in the end it's analogous to the driver of a racing car driving the car at 100 miles per hour without brakes. The thrill of the speed might be exhilarating but the result is likely to be fatal. And I think 
it applies in respect of government. Whereas if you've got a strong parliament holding ministers' feet to the fire, questioning, probing, scrutinising, challenging, contradicting, exposing the government of the day, it will make ministers that much sharper and less complacent about the policy they draw up, the announcements they make, and the way in which they treat parliament in the process. The last point I want to make, if I may, is on the subject of a new element that I've sought to introduce to the speakership, and I don't wish in any way to be immodest about it, but I think it's worthwhile. And that is the concept that the speaker can be an ambassador for parliament and a robust advocate of democratic politics. Traditionally, the speaker has tended to be very much an inward-looking, centrally focused and Westminster situated figure. And when I stood for election, I tried to develop the argument to my colleagues that we faced a major problem of public disengagement from the political process, which we couldn't possibly expect to tackle overnight. But I said to colleagues, look, if you elect me as speaker, I propose, with your support, to try to act as an ambassador for parliament, and as I say, a robust advocate of the merits of democratic politics, by getting out and about a bit into the public square, visiting schools and colleges and universities, public institutions, voluntary bodies, faith groups of one sort or another to talk about the role of the speaker and the functioning of democracy, how we're changing, why politics matters, in what ways people can engage with us. And we might start to develop some sort of rapport with the electorate whom we're here to serve. Now, this spawned a rather curious reaction. One of my colleagues who stood for speaker took part in a hustings with me. I won't name the honorable member in question. He is no longer a member of the House of Commons, a very distinguished and senior colleague who now sits in the upper house. But he was obviously horror struck by the suggestion that I might take or the speaker might take a public facing role. And I had made it absolutely clear that I fully respected the tradition of the speaker being impartial between the parties, but that I thought this public advocacy function could be useful. And he said, without initially naming me, but he then did, I'm bound to say, colleagues, that in recent times, in the course of the last week or two, I've heard colleagues talking about changing the institution of the speakership and developing uh, what I gather is described in the jargon as an ambassadorial function. My honorable friend, the member for Buckingham, is apparently proposing to engage in this novel approach to the execution of the duties of the chair. I am bound to say I have a reputation for speaking my mind in this house acquired, I think, not without merit over four decades, for speaking my mind candidly and without fear or favor. And I'm bound to say to colleagues that I think it would be profoundly injurious to the reputation of Parliament if the Speaker was to start to appear upon Sky News on a daily basis, venting his opinions on matters of public import. And I said to him, Patrick, if I had been advocating that, <laughs> you would be justified in criticizing me, but I was not, and therefore you are not. I'm not advocating anything of the kind. It is a grotesque caricature of my position. I wasn't suggesting that I should appear on television or news programs on a regular basis, and indeed the speaker should do no such thing. You shouldn't get embroiled in party controversies or try to be a pundit. I said, what I'm talking about is something rather more modest with respect, Patrick, and that. And that is that on periodic occasions in front of audiences, there's something to be said for trying to get a message across and in addition to talking to people, to hear from them. And I then found in the subsequent days that others caught on to this theme and tried to develop it themselves. But you can't convince everybody. About six months after I was elected, another member, not the noble Lord, Lord Cormac, as he now is, came up to me, and a rather aristocratic gentleman, and he said to me, Mr. Speaker, and I say to you, I, 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 uh, I, uh, I, 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 I didn't vote for you. I didn't vote for you. I mean, I'm about to say, 
ladies and gentlemen, I didn't exactly have to be Sherlock Holmes to have worked this out some considerable time <laughs> before. There wasn't the slightest prospect this side of eternity of this particular honourable gentleman voting for me for a variety of reasons. He said, I didn't vote for you. I voted for Sir George Young because I think he's a bloody good egg. But I said, I didn't vote for you. But I, I'm bound to say, I think we're doing frightfully well. I said, jolly, jolly good job. Well, well done. Well done. And, but I just want to make one point to you. Can I, can I, are, you, are, you, are you interested in hearing my point? And I said, yes, I, I'd love to hear your point. And he said, well, I, I, I'm not sure about this outreach business. This business of sort of visiting schools and sort of you know, universities and so on. And I, think, I, I, and I said, well, what is it about it that bothers you? Well, I, 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 I think it's a rum business, he said, a rum business. I don't know if you ever, have any of you here ever read P.G. Woodhouse, who writes about the British aristocracy? Well, who writes about Bertie Worcester and other sort of well-born idiots. And this chap said, well, I think it's sort of a rum business. And uh, you're ready, sort of curious, but either you're a speaker, a speaker in the chair, very important, very important role, very, very important. Uh, and then when you, when you, when you, when you finish in the chair, uh, speaker, you, you, you uh, at the end of the day, you should go back to speaker's house and you, you know, relax with your, your wife and your family, very important. Uh, but I think this business sort of going out and visiting schools and so forth, I, I, I think it's a rum business. And he basically meant that he thought it was beneath the dignity of the office. And I appreciated him being candid about it, but I said, I take completely the opposite view. In the modern age, you cannot get or keep respect for key institutions or offices by sort of dressing up in a fancy uniform, looking important and being completely impenetrable and inaccessible to the outside world. You've got to be prepared to make a case for yourself. And so I have spent a lot of time going around schools, universities and other bodies and I do welcome the UK Youth Parliament once a year to our chamber on a non-sitting day to debate the issues which they've chosen to debate. And, you know, if you think about it, what could be better for cultivating the skill of public advocacy or engendering in those young people some self-confidence than to give them the chance to perform in our chamber? You know, it's really actually quite a simple point. If we want to be respected by young people, we have to show some respect for young people. I was dumbfounded and aghast when one of my senior colleagues came up to me and said, I gather, Mr. Speaker, you are to chair the session of the UK Youth Parliament. And I said, yes, that's right. And he said, let me tell you, I predict for certain it will be an absolute unmitigated disaster. And I said, I, well, I didn't agree with that at all, but, you know, tell me what makes you... I know what I'm talking about. I've been here 38 years and more. And I said to him, no, no, I know exactly when you were elected, but what I'm arguing is, asking is, what's your argument? What's your central thesis? And he said, you mark my words. I tell you, I remember it very clearly to this day. He said, you mark my words, Mr. Speaker. If those young people come into the chamber to debate their issues, as you put it, at the very least, he said, chewing gum will be left all over the chamber. <laughs> And at the worst, he said, he was absolutely about to burst. He said, pen knives will be used and damage to these benches, which I love, will be done. And I said to him, well, I just think it's appalling that you should parody and caricature and malign young people in that way. I predict to you they'll come, they'll be proud to come, they'll speak well. And I also predict to you they'll behave a damn sight better than we do most days of the week, and I hate to say it because I know it's never popular when you say this, ladies and gentlemen, but I was right on all counts. They did themselves proud, and I thought it was a good thing. But of course, it's not just those one-offs or my visits around the country. We try interactively to communicate with schools and other institutions. We have workshops across the country about legislation and the operation of committees and how people can get involved. We have a whole parliamentary outreach service and an education service and it's a relatively new phenomenon I mean it's bizarre that it's a new phenomenon we'll be 800 years old in 2015 and we've had such a service since I think 2006 or 7 but it's now an expanding part of the work of Parliament and I hope you will feel as I do that this must have some merit maybe we can do it better maybe the resources should be deployed differently maybe the focus could change but the idea that we can ever again retreat into our lager and think that the only real engagement with the electorate is our own mailbag and our own door knocking during election campaign is so transparently absurd that only an extraordinary reactionary could seriously think it to be the right thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I have addressed you at considerable length. You will be mightily relieved to know, because I want to hear what you have to say to me, that having treated of the subject of the speaker in the chair, the reform process, in Parliament and my attempts to add to the functions of the office to be an ambassador, 
My remarks are thankfully at an end. Thank you. Thank you.